Hello, this is the Fiction Nonfiction Podcast from Literary Hub, where we believe that every issue in your social media feed, we always say Twitter, but now we have to change it. And you can listen to our last episode or two episodes ago to our interview with Dan Schoen to find out why. Um, or on the evening news has already been tackled somewhere in literature. I'm Whitney Terrell, the author of the novel, The Good Lieutenant. And I'm Phoebe Ganeshanathan, the author of the forthcoming novel, Brotherless Night. So we're taping this on Sunday, the 20th of November, and we both went to the movies this weekend. And what did you see? Well, I saw Wakanda forever, obviously. Yes, I did. I took my whole, our whole family went, uh, Check it out. Ate dinner, which was good because it's a very long movie, but uh, it's been very popular. Yeah, it's a uh, you saw it, I saw it, and apparently the rest of Earth saw it because as we tape this episode, it's the number one movie at the box office and already one of the top grossing films of the year. And it's long, but it certainly doesn't. There's not a moment that's slow. Uh, so this movie is the rare superhero sequel contending with the loss of a hero and search for a new one. With the death of Chadwick Boseman, who starred in the first film as T'Challa, and uh, and who's also the Black Panther, uh, the writers of this film had to they had to basically reconceive the whole story. And so there's um, in Wakanda Forever the sequel story. T'Challa's sister Shuri, played by Letitia Wright, travels to the the spirit realm in search of her brother. And it's not the only movie in which it's not the only moment in which the movie draws on on African folklore. And I think in recent years we've seen a ton of storytelling drawing on African folklore. I can think of you know some writers who've been on the show and and others um, some writers who've been on the show like Marlon James um, and others like Helen Oyeyemi, Akweke Amezi, and just a ton of others. And I feel like this is a real thing that we're seeing kind of proliferate in in contemporary storytelling in a really powerful way. Yeah, and I think we want to talk about it in this episode to talk about the use of African folklore in Wakanda forever, but also in contemporary literature now um, becomes increasingly part of the sort of arsenal that artists are working with. Um, and so we want to talk about the influence of African folklore on contemporary storytelling uh, with a terrific guest, the novelist Buki Papillon. Buki was born in Nigeria. She holds a law degree from Hull University in the United Kingdom, as well as an MFA in creative writing from Leslie University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Her debut novel, An Ordinary Wonder, has received rave reviews and mentions in the New York Times, Ms. Magazine, Essence, Cosmopolitan UK, Why Nija, and more. An Ordinary Wonder is also the winner of the inaugural Maya Angelou Book Award in Fiction, given by the Kansas City Public Library and six universities in Missouri. Woo! It's a Massachusetts, <laughs> it's a Massachusetts <laughs> book so awards. Much. <laughs> it's a, this is Whitney is, Whitney is um, one of the people, one of the reasons that this award exists. Um, so we're very happy also to have you on the show for that reason. Um, and An Ordinary Wonder is a Massachusetts book awards fiction honors recipient and a Faro Grumley literary award finalist. An alum of Key West, the Vermont Studio Center, the Fine Arts Work Center, and Bono Voices, Buki has published work in Post Road Magazine, Aunt Chloe, and the Del Sol Review. She's worked as a travel advisor, events host, and chef, and now lives and writes in Boston. Buki, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for having me. So uh, Whitney and I are both big comic book movie and TV watchers, and Black Panther is a favorite of mine. And the original creators of the character of Black Panther were Jack Kirby and Stan Lee, who were, of course, white. But the writer-director of both Black Panther films, Ryan Coogler, is Black, and he's made some significant changes to the source material. And uh, when we were emailing to invite you on the show, you were like, yes, now I have this great reason to dash to the theater and see Wakanda forever as soon as possible, which I was going to do anyway. So I'm curious what you thought of how the movie treats that source material and draws on African histories and folklore. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, it's such a treat to be here with you and also to um, for such a reason to um, talk about Wakanda forever. I loved it so much. I mean, the weaving and blending of traditions from African countries to create this entity called Wakanda. And also, um, where else are people of African ancestry going to draw from, if not our common histories and folklore? So, um, 
I loved the lip plates, the massive lip plates on the base of one of the character's lips, which is something that exists um, in, in some African, in an African country. Um, the water drums that they beat to open the invisible gate, the, the holographic mountains that disguise the entrance to um, Wakanda, um, the chalk dot patterns, the raised scarification designs on the skins of the characters. Um, so to see all these, um, all these traditions and all these cultures and all these people from African ancestry presented and celebrated and magnified um, all these aspects of, of these cultures from the gaze of the people themselves and not from the gaze of people who have um, from time immemorial denied the beauty, the grace, the magnificence really of African traditions it is so particularly important in these times. I loved that so much. And um, I also think one of the best things about the world we live in being so interconnected now is um, the increased collaboration of black artists and musicians and designers. Um, from around the world. And I think that comes through so much in um, Wakanda Forever and in the previous Black Panther movie. There is a proverb that says that a single broomstick cannot sweep alone. And I think the coming together of all people of African ancestry to create these kinds of movies, these kinds of um, um, events um, really is, is, is a sign of great things that are coming in the future. I really... Um also enjoyed the movie. And I think you're sort of touching on one of the things that I admire most about it. It's sort of like explicitly interested in being decolonial. Um, it's there are more than a few colonizer jokes in this movie and um, among other things. And, and sort of one of the main ways that the movie is doing that is with its engagement with African traditions and folklore, um, which is very, very cool. Yes, yes. Um, I, I, I always, I mean, one of the things that I, that I believe is that we are creatures that exist at the juncture of myth and imagination. And this is how we perpetuate ourselves. And um, so I think this is why the retelling of all the myths from all over the world is so popular today, because we are beginning to um, look around and find out more and more about our universe and realize that, you know, it leaves us um, less and less sure of our relevance within it. And so um, this makes us look back to, okay, what, make, what makes us, where are we from? And so we build our stories in order, to, in order to be able to reassure ourselves of our existence. So this, these things really matter so much. I mean, somebody, someone actually, I read somewhere, someone was like, oh, it's, what's the big deal? It's just a Marvel movie. And I looked at this person who was obviously not of African ancestry. <laughs> and said um you know i, I mean I, I sort of I, not that i looked at the person but if i had had the opportunity to sit down and talk to this person i would have said you know if you've always seen yourself reflected back it is perhaps impossible to grasp the depth and gravity of what was stolen from those um you know um from those who have been obscured or bypassed um, so it is impossible to really grasp that this is not just a Marvel movie. This is, the, this is people who have not been traditionally able to see themselves as the heroes of the story, as people living independently in a land that is wonderful and technologically advanced. And so all of these things um, are the things I would have liked to tell this person that it's not just a movie. It's we exist, like I said, at the juncture of imagination and myth. And so it is really important that we all see ourselves reflected back. Uh, speaking of imagination and myth, you know, most a lot, there's a ton of superhero stories in which, you know, a human is transformed in some way into an animal or a fish or a spider. Um, and Black Panther is an obvious example of this, you know, and in African myth, you know, deities can also appear in non-human form. Um, maybe they're a little bit like superheroes. Uh, I did find this recent Time Magazine article on Wakanda Forever by the writer and illustrator Elizabeth Agiamang, I think is how I'm saying, I'm reading her name, so I haven't heard it said, but, um, and she talks about the myths of um, Ananse, uh, the trickster spider who outsmarts all other animals. And I wonder if you could just talk about the ways that gods and humans take on non-human form in African folklore and myth. 
Oh, yeah, I grew up with those sorts of stories. Um, for example, um, the equivalent of um, Anansi in Nigeria. I always, I always joke that Anansi is like um, is like a Ghanaian uncle because Anansi is from Ghanaian tradition, and I'm from. I, I grew up in Nigeria. I'm Nigerian, so he's like the the the, the Ghanaian uncle who is the equivalent of um, Ijapa the tortoise. So um, the tortoise is a trickster character in, in so many stories that I grew up um, listening to. And um, also he was a trickster that had access to the ears of the gods. So sometimes he would be really, really smart and, and, and get access to information that other animals didn't have, but he would not always use it for good. And so these tales were told to help children grow up to be good citizens of the community. There were morality tales that um, modeled decent behavior and taught valuable lessons. So um, Ijakpa would do things like help the king, um, trick some other animal. There's a, there's a short story about how, why his shell, um, the tortoise shell is not smooth. And that is because um, the animals were all really hungry and tortoise had, this, had figured out how to make a rope so he could climb up to heaven. And um, and so he got he, he figured out that the thing to do was to um, every animal was to try and find out where all the other animals had hidden their mothers. So he found out where rabbit had hid, hidden his mother, and then he tried to go up the rope and um, and actually go and um, eat rabbit's mother. And so while he was going up the rope, rabbit called out to his mother, cut the rope, cut the rope. And so rabbit's mother cut the rope and the tortoise fell down and he broke his back. And so the morality of that is that um, pretty much that it's um, not good to trick people <laughs> in order <laughs> to take advantage of them. So that kind of, um, so, so yeah, they, they, and, and, and so tortoise takes on human aspects and human characteristics in order to um, provide a valuable means of teaching traditions and mores and, uh, and good behavior um, to children growing up. I guess the closest parallel to that from this continent is the Native American stories, the coyote acts as the, as the trickster figure. Uh, I'm sure you've read some of those in a yes. similar way. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So um, one of the other places that some of the characters in Wakanda Forever, for example, go for moral guidance while we're talking about the morality of all of this, um, a lot of characters go to the spirit realm and there's a lot of ancestor worship. And in the first film, T'Challa goes to the spirit realm to see his father, T'Chaka. And in the second film, um, the one that we've just seen, Shuri, his sister goes to the spirit realm in search of her brother um, and kind of finds, uh, I guess we're not having spoilers here. So I'll just say she encounters a surprise. And your novel contains a lot of references to destiny um, or Ori um, of its protagonist, Odalaren, who is uh, born intersex. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about those those calls to other realms and how they draw on African folklore and how you use them in, in your book and how you saw them in the movie. Um, yeah, I, I love that in the movie. I love the way they um, have continued that in the previous and the current storyline. Um, I think that these um, calls to other realms that we saw um, Shuri going back to try and figure out um, what, um, what was the right way forward, um, they center an important aspect of so many African spiritual beliefs um, that death is only a transition, for example. Um, so um, if I'll take that to the, to the Yoruba traditions, um, the spirit realm is believed to literally exist alongside the natural world that we are living in. So um, we are considered to be heavenly creatures that were sent to um, what the Yoruba literally call the marketplace of life. So, um, so it's like we, we're here to trade and learn good behavior and learn good manners so that we can return to, our, to the heavenly realm from where we came as good citizens um, now fit to live in that realm. So um, in an ordinary wonder, I drew on this Yoruba belief that um, humans are born with some predestination, like um, an Ori, which is, um, which is not unlike being dealt a hand of cards, right? So um, we then play that, those cards, hopefully in a way that would enable us um, at the end of our lifetimes 
to return to the um, gentle heaven of the, the good and gentle heaven of the ancestors instead of the um, horrible um, heaven of shards, literally of shards. I don't know why it has pot shards, but that is how it is like broken bits of pottery. I do not know why that imagery is what um, is what consists of the Yoruba um, idea of hell. So, but that's the hell, that's where people who, are, who, come to, um, who come to earth and do not do the right thing, that's where they go. But in the meantime, um, every child born in Yoruba land had to be presented um, um, to, um, to the Babalawo so that they are ori, they, are, they, could, they could know what cards they brought to the earth that they could um, and what they should do and what they should not do. Um, and so I liked that um, there was this whole idea that the ancestral realm existed somewhere um, where um, Shuri could go and sort of um, ask questions of people that had gone before. And so in the Yoruba tradition, we have um, similar things. And I do refer to that quite a bit in An Ordinary Wonder. Yeah, I was, uh, well, first of all, just for our listeners who aren't familiar, um, the Yoruba people, there are people in uh, Nigeria, right? That's who you're yes. referring to when you're talking about that. Could you just talk oh, yeah, about them? Yeah. Just yeah. yeah. Um, so the Yoruba people of Nigeria, um, that's, well, my, my novel is um, actually set in, in, in Ibadan which is um, in Nigeria. And, and um, the Yoruba people, Nigeria is made up of um, several um, different ethnicities and um, there's Yoruba, Igbo, Hausa. So Nigeria did not exist, which comes back to the whole idea of colonized, colonizers and colonization. Nigeria is a construct. Nigeria was created by the British. Um, they, they basically came in and um, drew a line around a whole lot of people who, have existed and had separate histories um, and separate traditions and separate languages and uh, basically decided that you are all going to become a country. And so um, we are living with that to this day. And um, Nigeria has over 200 languages. So the Yoruba people have all these myths and all these traditions that go back um, to ancestral times. And um, a lot has been um, written and a lot of things that we are seeing nowadays are actually um, based on a lot of Yoruba traditions. Um, for example, um, something like um, Beyonce's, um, one of Beyonce's most popular videos she actually had a Yoruba person draw this whole, um, these, these traditional designs and chalk stripes all over her face and all over her body. And um, so there are all these wonderful traditions that have been carried forward in, um, from Yoruba land. And it seems like one of the things that, um, first of all, I'm curious, which Beyonce video is that? I think I know, but uh, maybe you could, if, if you remember, do you remember? Recall no, I don't. <laughs> okay, we'll um for our for our listeners um we'll go and look that up and we'll we'll link to it in our show notes. But it seems like one of the things your book does and that the movie does and that and that Beyonce's video does is sort of unite the Black diaspora, um, the African diaspora, with all of its lines of various lines of descent um, in this conversation about about folklore and um, yeah, that's that's just a thing that I appreciated in the book, and and I think Whitney is going to ask you about this particular term. Well, I want to go back to the you mentioned this earlier the the Babalao, um character in your novel, and I was I was thinking about the ways that there are parallels between Wakanda Forever and your book, and you know, there's this early uh, your your main character early has this scene with a Babalao, um where she's lying down and they're chanting and doing various things around her and and. It, very reminiscent of the scenes where uh, the characters who are going to be Black Panther take the our heart shaped herb and go and visit the spirit realm, right? That happens to both to Shuri and to T'Challa in the various movies. I wondered if you saw those parallels also when you were watching the movie. Um, yes, I did. Um, those were so magical, um, and those um, Babalawos have existed um, in Yoruba tradition forever. I mean, the 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 Ifa, they so they are they use the Ifa divination system. It's one of the oldest divination systems in the world. It uses a system of binary code. Um, there are um, two hundred and 
56. I'm not sure about the number. Odus. Odus are like um, codes. And so when they cast their divination chains, um, whatever story the, um, these, these chains tell them, they can interpret what needs to be done for the person that has come to see them from this. And then, and, and so they work closely with um, Onishegun. So there's the Babala one, there's the Onishegun, who, who is the herbalist. So the Babala can tell the Onishegun, oh, this is what is going on with this person. And then the herbalist has some idea of what to do. So th that scene um, where, um, where um, Shuri has to take, um, well, I don't, I'm not sure if I'm spoiling That's okay. something. Yes, no, I'm that's okay. I think we sure. can say that. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that scene is definitely reminiscent because um, that, that was what would typically happen. People would come in, there would be chanting, there would be incantations, there would be something to either put on the skin or to swallow or to be rubbed on the body. So all of these things um, were the sorts of um, rituals that would take place in order for the Babalawa to be able to communicate with the spirit with the spirit world and understand what needed to be done for this person. So Babalawas have been on the, at the center of life um, in Yoruba society, in Nigerian society, um, you know, births, deaths, dedications, problem solving, um, nobody was above consulting them, including the king or queen. Um, and, and, they, and I also appreciated um, the whole, the idea of ancestral, um, consulting the ancestors in Wakanda forever, because that is sort of how Babalawas are. They're like a living record of the lives and ancestry of their particular village. Like no child would be considered to have started life right without being dedicated to a Babalawu. Um, and then the Babalawa would find out what's their personal, I mean, Orisha. So an Orisha is like a, a, a deity. And so there, there, there's this whole pantheon of Yoruba deities and they needed to find out which particular deity would bring the, the right destiny to this child. So the child would know um, what were the things to do or to not do. And so the Babalawa would then be able to tell them what path would best benefit their, um, their particular destiny. So for example, there's a deity of twins. And um, Otolumi in my book um, is actually a twin. And there is a specific set of instructions that accompany the birth of twins and the upbringing of twins and what parents have to do in the unfortunate situation that one twin passes away. So there are specific rituals, like the mother has to make an image of the twin that has passed away and tie that and, and look after that um, image, little wooden image as if it was a real baby and feed it and tie, it, strap it to her back and do everything. And just so that the other twin would be persuaded um, to stay in the realm of the living. So, um, and Babala was where um, consulted in the case of say um, family, marital disagreements, disputes over land, um, often in conjunction with the herbalist. And also um, the Babala was role in an ordinary wonder represents a time when the Western imposed gender binary um, wouldn't have been at the forefront in, in Nigerian society, because Otto is um, of course intersex. And um, when the possibilities of what bodies could be were shaped by a different and more fluid understanding of societal roles. So, and, and, and the Babalawo, um, someone once asked me, you know, how did Babalawo have any idea what was going on um, at this, with, with Otto at this time and um, when everybody else was so confused. And I said, you know, um, Babala was having confronted with all possible um, human situations since the dawn of time. And the wisdom that they share is passed down to them from the previous Babala who trained them and to the Babala before that and the one before that. And the, so there's a long unbroken line. And so they've seen all possible human situations and they are able to speak wisdom to all situations, even when those situations seem so unique to the actual people facing the dilemma. And I think I loved um, that in Wakanda, they, when, when there was a need to seek wisdom, going back to these sort of ancestral um, roots to seek, um, to, to seek answers, to seek knowledge, to seek guidance, um, even though they had all of this technology 
um, I thought that was such a beautiful touch and I really loved it. That I do want to get this like... in because Sugi, it's your turn to ask a question, but I do want to say, because you did the research on this, Sugi, that Chadwick Boseman specifically spoke to a Yoruba Babalao when he was preparing for the movie. And, you you know, so there's a direct connection with the tradition that you're talking about here in the movie. I mean, there's no accent that those scenes do appear similar. All right, Sugi, it's your turn. Sorry. <laughs> That's OK. And then, I mean, one of the other things I was reading was that. Um, the Mali, the the ruler from Mali, Mansa Musa, was one of the inspirations for Black Panther, and and he was, of course, fabulously rich. And Wakanda is also fabulously rich and draws on technology. But one of the main arcs you see in Wakanda is, you know, Shuri is a scientist, and that's kind of her identity. And she's a skeptic about the about all of these things, like the ancestral realm, like consulting the spirits, um, you know. And over the course of the film, you watch her kind of make a journey to acceptances of of multiple levels of of belief and like an ability to turn to different kinds of resources like all the resources that are available to her including african myth and folklore and um and one of the main reasons that in your book um as you were talking about uh oto is is sent to the babalao is because she is born intersex and and forced to live as a boy but identifying as a girl and so she's struggling to become herself and and in the first black panther film there's the kind of coming of age of t'challa as he becomes king like what kind of king is he going to be and in the second black panther film of course um shuri has to contend with his death and that is a kind of coming of age there's a moment in the movie where where Mbaku says to her, so much has been taken from you. Um, how can you, you can't still be called a child. And I wonder if you could talk about kind of coming of age in folklore and, and in your book and, and in the movie. Thank you. I loved that moment between um, Mbaku and Shuri. It was such an acknowledgement and such a, a sort of a coming together of these two different things because in the first Black Panther, they were not, um, he, he, he looked down on her almost and, and, and considered her a child and, um, and, and almost, and, 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 her, and her scientific um, knowledge to him was not, um, was not anything that could stand up to um, the, the knowledge passed on from the ancestors to him. And so to see them come to this sort of moment of sort of acknowledging each other and accepting that technology does not have to exclude the, the passed down wisdom of the ancients and, um, and that these two things were not mutually exclusive, but that they could actually work in conjunction with each other, which in a way is what we sort of see um, ending up um, eventually um, happening. And so, um, I, I think um, it was it was interesting to see this coming of age aspect in Wakanda because many cultures worldwide have rituals that mark um, adulthood. Um, the 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 the, um, the coming of age, the coming of age, the what what are they called? Those dances, the cotillons um, that that um, in in Western societies to bring yeah, like debut de de debutants. Yes, exactly. Sure. Yes, yes, and and the. Um, Quinceaneras and um, in, in parts of Eastern Nigeria, there were actually fattening rooms where young women would be sent to go and be fattened up because this was considered utterly beautiful. So a young woman who had come of age um, and was of age to marry would be fattened up and, and, and um, her, her skin would be covered in camwood powder and she would be um, made to look beautiful as, um, as a young woman who was now um, of age. And so, um, in an ordinary wonder, Otter's coming of age is actually a source of danger because she is a, a person who is at an intersection um, because she cannot openly be who she knows herself to be. And at the same time has a body whose mysteries she's desperately trying to unravel um, before it's too late. And the way she puts it, um, you know, she has to unravel the mysteries of her body before she is stuck the wrong way. So, um, so her coming of age, um, when all the other teenagers around her are discovering um, the other, um, are, are going to parties, discovering makeup, discovering dresses, discovering boys or girls or in between whatever they, they so 
she is in this place where her body is completely foundering and the normal typical coming of age rituals that would actually um, have accompanied um, her, her teenage years are completely taken away from her um, because, um, because, because she's born intersex. And so um, I really enjoyed the, that, that um, idea that um, a young person like Shuri is celebrated for her intelligence and for her wisdom, even though, and, and, as, a, and as a scientist in Wakanda, and um, even though she's only so young, and I think um, that this this aspect really just made the movie so um, so amazing. So I've noticed you've already quoted us one uh, proverb uh, in this essay, and uh, the, the book has a number of African proverbs in it. The first reads, a person who sells eggs should not start a fight in the market. Another says, the mouse is a bringer of disaster to the home of the innocent. Snakes do not eat corn. I'm not sure I fully understand that one. You're going to have to explain that one to me. <laughs> um, but uh, how, do, how do these connect to descriptions of intersex persons and what are their origins? Could you talk about that and then maybe read to us a passage from the book? Uh, yes. Oh, I love that that particular one that you wanted me to um, um, unpack a little. Um, well, I get the part about the mouse is a bringer of disaster to the home. Now we all feel that way, but I'm confused about the snake part. Um, well, what would a snake be looking for in your house? And why would a mouse come into your house? You have a store oh, okay. of corn. So the mouse comes into you. your house to get after the corn. And, and so, yeah, I enjoy playing with this. And, and, this, and this one was particularly relevant um, because um, being intersex in Nigeria carries such a, a, a and in, in many African countries, and in many parts of the world till fairly recently, um, um, carried such a, a, a danger um, because not only was the intersex person um, having to cope with society's perception of them, but they had to cope with what might happen to their loved ones if their secret was revealed. And so in this, in this case, um, these proverbs refer to the depths to which Otto's family and therefore Otto herself must go in order to hide herself from um, the repercussions of being intersex in Nigerian society. And intersex persons and LGBTQI persons in many parts of the world currently still do face persecution. Um, so Otto's story is one of reaching deep into the folklores and ancestral stories, as well as the book of Proverbs, which is something that was a gift um, in, the, in the novel. She actually has a book of Proverbs that is a gift from the Babalawo that she, um, who, who her mother takes her to see. And so um, she reaches deep into these folklores and ancestral stories in order to find or create an image and a story of herself that is different from the one that her family and the society around her is perpetuating, which is a story that she is some sort of a creature or, or a monster. So um, in, in, in doing this, in fighting back like this, she brings upon herself and, and her loved ones for certain, she brings down the wrath of those who want to persecute her um, because she's fighting back using proverbs, using ancestral stories, using folklore, using imagery. Um, but at the same time, her fight for freedom carries a cost. But the I think part of the part of the the message, um, if one might put it that way, is of, of the book is that silence is not the answer either. That you know, sometimes um, there is no option but to fight. And 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 the, and I found that really interesting in Wakanda, where Shuri has where Shuri faces these choices where she is given and, and I don't want to give to um, do a spoiler but where she also where, where the, the choices are do you fight or do you not fight and what constitutes the right fight what what is the way to what is um, in, in the process of fighting for justice what constitutes the right fight the good fight so An Ordinary Wonder is set in two timelines. The timeline um, before, which is um, when Otto Loring was living with her mother, and the timeline now, which is when Otto Loring is at a boarding school and is age 15. 
So I'm going to read from now, 1992, Otolori is age 15, page 118. With discipline lax on the first day of term, Darren and I sneak up the fire escape stairs after lights out to lie on the forbidden dome roof and watch the night sky. I've missed him so much, it's hard to not just stare at him nonstop, but it's more than that. He went home ordinary dairy and came back magnetic. I glance yet again at his profile and he catches my eyes. His smile, which always bubbles up so easily for me, stops my heart mid-beat, after which it seems determined to pound all my blood into my hot face. Tell him who you really are. That small voice in my head says, it will be okay. It sounds just like that voice that once urged me to try on Mama Undo's wig, to wear Wura's dress. The one that said it was okay to sing in the shower. And look where all that got me. Derry points out a squiggly collection of stars. That's the constellation called Orion. If you mix that into Yoruba mythology, it would be called Ode, the hunter. If you draw an imaginary line between those bright ones, it resembles a man with a bow and arrow. I follow his finger and it does indeed come together like a join the dots picture. So, Daring, I say in my best investigative reporter tone, are you sure your dad told you the truth? You're not in actual fact the adopted outcome of a union between a dictionary and an encyclopedia? Ha ha, very funny. Daring pokes me in the side and I try not to squeal out loud. I just love reading dad's books and magazines. When I was younger, he'd read them to me and show me the pictures. Then as I grew up and could read them for myself, it all said to make sense, like putting on my glasses for the first time and really seeing. These days he suggests books he thinks I should read so we can discuss them after. Those are the best times. There's such a great big world out there. So many different types of people, so many ways to live and be, you realize, there's no one right or wrong way. My heart starts pounding loud enough to deafen me. There's no one right or wrong way to be. Maybe I can do this slantwise. So, did your dad ever tell you any Yoruba creation myths? Yes, I love those. It's kind of uncanny how cultures worldwide have similar myths about a watery earth where everything must be newly formed by God who quarrel amongst each other just like humans, but with superpowers. My favorite from the Yoruba cosmology is about Obatala. Wanna hear it? A shiver runs down my back as I nod. What were the chances? Odumare, the supreme god, put Obatala in charge of making human bodies. He was good at his job, except when he got drunk on palm wine. He'd fall asleep afterwards, then wake up to realize he's made a batch of imperfect people some with one arm or leg shorter than the other, some with no eyes, some with twisted bodies. And that's the explanation for basically anyone who doesn't look the norm, you know, like albinos and dwarves and so on. So that would include people like your 12 fingered uncle and that hunchback American drama you told me about. Exactly. It's all make believe of course, but dad says our stories and myths are what make us eternal because that's how we learn from past mistakes and pass on the lessons and wisdom of our ancestors. That sounds right. I'm thinking of, of Babalawo, but unwilling to mention I used to see him. Not that Darian would judge, but I've learned not to reveal things that lead to questions I can't answer. I sometimes wonder if Babalawo accepted and declared that I'm a girl without so much as a blink because he's a kind and good man who truly sees people for who they are or because Ifa and the Yoruba cosmology have provided answers for so many centuries to so many people's life issues that to him, my condition was just another riddle of the gods, as he put it, for him to solve. I was just another person for him to unite with her life's purpose, a creation of Obatala, whose Ori had given him instru instructions on who I wanted to be. Dad always says, by all means, take your pinch of Thackeray, but with a bushel of Thiongo, Daring's voice brings me back from my musings. I know Thiongo, but who's Thackeray? Oh, some old English writer who wrote this huge book called Vanity Fair that is one of dad's favorites. So which deity do you like best? Yemoja, I say, 
remembering the lost joys of visiting Yeyemin's realm. She is the divine mother who birthed the other gods and goddesses. She's so beautiful. Ah, dad once took me to an artist studio in Badagri. He had a stunning painting called Yemoja. She wore a crown of stars. Sometimes the stars shine on her fingernails, I dreamily add. Oh yeah? And how do you know that? Darin's grin is teasing. Because sometimes, okay, this sounds really strange, but she appears to me, oh well, used to, in your dreams? Darin's eyebrows are clearing the rim of his glasses. Are his eyes more guarded? I hear a faint noise in the stairwell and perk my ears. Things stay silent. It also gives me a moment to think about how to answer Daring. Yes, I mean, no, I don't really know. When things got really bad at home, she'd kind of appear and I'd feel better. That wasn't even what I'd planned to say. Like an imaginary friend? Yes, my arms fold around my chest. The damp night has slid under my skin. We should go in. Barry nods, bumps my head sideways with his to show we're all right. What sane 15 year old still sees imaginary people? Buki, thank you so much for reading that for us. Um, and we want to thank you for joining us. And listeners, don't miss Buki's debut novel, An Ordinary Wonder, which is out now. Thank you so much for having me. It has been really great to chat with you. And I always add and ask that people also seek out and read books by intersex authors and follow and support intersex advocacy groups like the ILGA and Interact and Intersex Nigeria as well. Thank you. And I want to say uh, Suki and I were both in Kansas City for the Writers for Readers benefit dinner, which was by the time everyone hears this a couple of weeks ago. But that was when we announced that uh, when Fong Wen, uh, my friend, announced that you had won the uh, Maya Angelou Book Award. And we're it's a new award that we're all here in Missouri working to uh, create, and we're so thrilled that you are this year's winner. Thank you so much. I was absolutely thrilled to hear that I'd won, and it has just been such a wonderful moment in my life and in the life of this book, An Ordinary Wonder. Um, and um, this is for all the Otto Lorins out there. I hope you all find joy. Thank you so much. And for our listeners, we will link in our show notes to uh, the advocacy groups that uh, Buki just mentioned. Thanks again.